are rolling now, so you're good there. So that camera will be on you. This camera's on both of us. So yes, you don't want to be, you don't want to step that way anymore. Okay. So that's all good. Okay, I'm recording. That's always my fear. Is <laughs> you get through it all and you forgot to press the record button. Yeah. Best interview ever. I know, <laughs> I know. And I just, oh. Okay, Matthew Henderson and it's Osmanuka. Osmanuka, yes. Okay. And fun, well, Funny Honey is the uh, the main company, the main business that we have. Okay. Osmanuka is a brand uh, within Funny Honey. So basically that's Australian Manuka shortened up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But we do own Osmanuka.com and Osmanuka as a business name. Um, however, we run that under Funny Honey. Funny Honey. Yes. Okay. Alright. So it's actually not Osmanuka as the brand because that can get a little bit tricky in the future with uh, the lawsuits that New Zealand are trying to put onto Australia. It's still going. Oh, it's still going, yes. We're members of the Australian Manuka Honey Association, so uh, part of the uh, purchase of the Manuka Honey uh, goes towards helping fight uh, that in court. Yeah. That's international trademark laws where New Zealand is trying to claim that uh, Manuka is a New Zealand word. Uh, however, we could go even further back and say that Manuka is an English word, so maybe England should sue them for using the English language because we could keep going back further and further. The scaparium, the Manuka uh, that they're talking about is Leptospermum scaparium. That originally comes from Australia and so does New Zealand. Uh, right, yes. <laughs> so they took it with them when the continent, when it broke away from Australia. Uh, however, it still grows here. Um, they're only, they only have uh, one type of high-grade manuka. They have two, two leptospermum varieties in, in New Zealand. We have 84. So we've just finished testing all of them and found that um, mo uh, about at least 16 of them are much stronger than New Zealand's manuka, which is also Australia's manuka. Mm. That's why we have uh, towns in places like Canberra that are well over 100 years old that are called manuka yeah. because we call it manuka as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's bizarre. What it's very bizarre. Mm. It's bizarre that I find um, that the New Zealanders living here in Australia mm. have a big problem with us using the word Manuka mm. when there's streets around here named Manuka Street. Yeah. Uh, so th it, they, these are facts that they can't deny. Yeah. Um, although they do make a lot of money from their Manuka honey and that's why they are very um, determined not to let anybody else use that word. Uh, we've been using it for over a hundred years, so really they need to get a time machine and go back into the past and change the past because uh, we use that word as yeah. well. Well, they sort of changed it to Manuka, didn't they? So that they could claim that that was their word, I think. Have uh, you heard of the Manuka? Because it changed. Well, I was, so five years ago when I was looking into the leptospermum plantations, um, it went from Manuka to Manuka in a year. And that's when all the trademarking and stuff. Oh, okay. So that's the way they pronounce it. I think so, because Manuka is there. Well, in Canberra, that's the way that they pr pronounce that suburb as well. Well, you can't call it Manuka down there. It has to be Manuka. Oh. So that's the way it's always been, been, um, oh. been uh, uh, pronounced, pronounced in, in, in Australia yeah. as far as down south. Right. But up here, we're more bogans being in Queensland, so it's Manuka. <laughs> Yeah, so um, it's, it's part of the leptospermum family. We have 84 plants here that are part of the leptospermum family, um, all with varying DHA within the nectar. Some are so low that they are, 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 not, um, are not active at all. So it's basically just Manuka honey that's a lower grade, but it does contain a chemical called leptosperin. And leptospirin is responsible for um, anti-inflammatory effects. So that's also um, uh, looked for within the honey when they analyze the honey. So you've got the antibiotic and the anti-inflammatory. And anti-inflammatory. And leptospirin is unique to the leptospermum uh, plant. Right. Yes. Okay. So they are looking for that um, with the leptospermum scaparium because it does have a, a high amount of um, leptospirin within the nectar. So there's certain chemical signatures that they're trying to look for to determine whether it's authentic Manuka honey is if it has that uh, spike within the chemical analysis of the, um, 
uh, leptosperin chemical. So as long as it's over a certain amount, then it can qualify as a Manuka honey. Okay, so that's um, even more advanced than what I know with the DHA. That's yes. completely separate then. Yes. That's okay. one of the chemical signatures that they're looking for to authenticate that it's actually Manuka honey, that it comes from the Leptospermum scoparium. Because okay. only a Leptospermum scoparium, I'm pretty sure only Leptospermum scoparium has that amount of Leptosperin in it. Ah. That's why New Zealand is trying to claim that their uh, honey is maybe more beneficial for you is because most of it comes just from the Leptospermum scoparium, yeah. which has the higher amount of, of the um, Leptosperin in the nectar. However, a lot of our plantations here in Australia have that as well. Yeah. So, and we are also working on hybrids of local jelly bush, which is the polygalifolium, crossed with the scoparium to um, get a higher amount of anti-inflammatory effect as well as the anti, uh, antifungal, antimicrobial and um, antiseptic qualities. Yeah, so what's so special about honey is the fact that it's the only substance on the planet that no bacteria is resistant to. So unlike human um, drugs, where we're getting more and more bacteria resistant, <laughs> we might have to change position. <laughs> Hadn't planned on the neighbor sparking off his uh, whippers. I can ask him to go down there for a second. If you can. Yeah. Hey, Reese. How you going? Good, how are you? Mate, I've, I'm, I'm, my moment of stardom is being <laughs> interviewed with her. <laughs> oh, you... I was just wondering, yeah. she's just, she's got a YouTube thing. Yes. She's just doing a quick, uh, no for, only for five minutes. All good, I'll go on the other end. She's just talking to me about the Manuka plants and things like that. No worries. Bit of promotion through the shop. Yep. She's cool. only just started. I'm yep. sorry to be a pain no, no, in the no, ass, mate. mate. No, please come and see me. No, otherwise I'll just keep happily fucking with this. <laughs> <laughs> no, Thanks for that, mate. Thank you. We'll only be five, ten minutes anyway, mate. Awesome. I think it's, ca it's called in the back of a ute. Look out for it, there'll be a 10 million views, you watch. <laughs> Mirror. Ooh, he nearly knocked that over. Okay. All right, well, I may as well introduce you now, Matthew. Yes. This is Matthew Henderson um, of Funny Honey, but he also does the Oz Manuka as well. That's right, Funny Honey on Tambourine Mountain, on yes. Gallery Walk. And yeah, so when I first met you a couple of years ago, you just had the stall outside the shop. And yes. then I came back a year later and you've got your own shop. Yes, well, we, I started selling up there on the side of the road under an umbrella. I was paying rent to a shop. And um, then the council said I wasn't allowed to do that after about a year and a half. And I'd already built up a lot of clientele, a lot of customers who'd come back just for my honey. Yeah. Um, so we decided to open a shop. And three weeks later, the pandemic came. So uh, for a year, I was just basically selling at the front of the shop. Okay. Yes. So yeah. I have to get my breath, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Jumping over the fence. Jumping over the fence, I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> Need some more Manuka, honey. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, we, I persisted with it. I didn't want to give up on my dream uh, just because of, of what had happened with the so tourists. Did you have to close the shop completely or were you still allowed open but of course everybody locked well, down? Well we they? were sort of uh, allowed open. Sometimes we weren't. There were, were times where no one could open. Right. Um, a lot of the time we were allowed to open but no one was allowed out of their house or within five kilometres of their house. Yes. Unfortunately being on Mount Tambourine there's only a limited amount of people <laughs> up there. Yeah. So no one could make it to our shop. We were forced to, to close. Do you do any online business? We do some online. Um, it's not big at the moment. I'm just about to release a new website. I've got a guy working on that. Yeah. A bit more professional. I've done everything myself. So we're sort of slowly building and whatever we make pretty much goes back into more beehives, um, improving the shop, um, yeah. improving the labels, uh, just out improving our, 
our future um, stability once everything comes back to normal again. Yeah, because so. what caught my attention with you was that you're actually a beekeeper and you have started growing your own plantations as well. Yes. So, because usually you're either a beekeeper and you travel your bees to these plantations or you're the farmer that's actually growing the plantation. Well, you sort of crossed it over a little bit, haven't you? Yes. Well, what got me into uh, honey and beekeeping in the first place was a stomach infection that I had about 12 years ago. And um, the doctors had given me antibiotics that hadn't worked. Uh, I'd gone to the hospital and had endoscopies uh, into my stomach. There was nothing that they could do to fix it. They didn't know what it was. And just by chance, uh, Coles and Woolworths were still were selling the uh, higher grade Manuka honey on the shelf, uh, 20 plus UMF yeah. or NPA, which is Australia's equivalent to UMF. And um, I was get, it was half price. So I thought I'll just buy something that's high quality cheap. Yeah. And pretty much within a couple of teaspoons of it, my stomach started feeling better straight away. It was so obvious that that was fixing it. Um, so I just kept eating it yeah. because it was so interfering. The, the stomach problems that I had was really interfering with my life, yeah. uh, with my comf comfort. So uh, with, it was painful then, was it? Very painful, not constantly, but usually every day, different moments during the day, bloating, um, sharp cramps in, in the stomach. Um, they thought it might have been H. pylori. Um, it, it wasn't an ulcer. There was no sore there, but it was very red and inflamed at the top. Um, Did they check for parasites? They hadn't checked for parasites. Um, this had gone on for about a year and they were trying different types of antibiotics and, yeah. and things like that. Um, and then because it was so noticeable, I went back to and bought all the rest of what they had on the shelf. Yeah. And I just kept eating it um, every day. Um, and if I'd stopped, usually for a few days, then it would come back again. Wow. So I realised I had to be having this every day. Um, so I decided that it was something that I needed a big supply of and then I thought I'd just grow it myself. Uh, so I went and learned how to do beekeeping and bought some beehives and um, learned about the Manuka plants. And at that time, coincidentally, the, the Sunshine Coast University were just about to do a sweep of Australia's Manuka plants yep. and test all the DHA. So my timing was perfect. And I contacted them and they sent me out some test kits and my wife and I, uh, we would stop and we would test plants on the side of the road, in the bush, um, all over the place. So even at the edge of parks, we would notice them in nature strips that hadn't been cleared yet. Yeah. Um, still native manukas that were there. So we've got some very interesting, unique varieties. That, yeah, um, wow. So you were taking cuttings then, were you? Every single plant that we would take a test of, we would take a cutting from just in case it came back really high and yeah. we could get back to that. We would have that, uh, uh, that plant again. So um, over about, about two years, they did a, a, a database on how strong the DHA was within the nectar of, of the, uh, the variations of the leptospermum. Yeah. And they found that the whitey eyes and the speciosums, which are around the Sunshine Coast area, are around about, some of them they found six times stronger yeah. than the, your traditional scaparium. So there's some very high grade stuff out there. Um, the, to, uh, the normal DHA uh, ratio in the nectar of say a scaparium, which comes from New Zealand, is around about 3,000 parts per million DHA. In the ones that they found, they were up to 28,000 DHA yeah. parts per million. So it's very strong plants that we have here. And so what's the connection then with the DHA in the leptospermum and the bees? What, what, what happens? What's the process? Well, the, the DHA, once the honey's uh, been made, so the bees go and take the nectar from the, from the plant, from the flower. Um, then they, have, they adjust the moisture level like a normal honey and then they put a cap on it. And then once it sits there, it starts breaking down from DHA into methyl glyoxyl. And methyl glyoxyl is an antiseptic. So the, the greater amount of DHA, then the greater amount of um, methyl glyoxyl you're going to have. Although there is a maturation um, process that's required, as fresh Manuka honey isn't as antiseptic as what it is if you leave it for oh, aged a, a bit. Leave it aged a bit. Yeah. So it has to have time to break down from uh, DHA into methyl glyoxyl. That process does take time. It can be sped up by heating the honey but that can hurt the honey and it also uh, um, 
it reduces the potential, the maximum potential. So oh. you would have gotten to maybe a thousand uh, MGO, but because they rushed it and they wanted to heat it, they might only get to 800. Right. So you'd sacrifice your maximum potential if you are impatient. Yeah. So you're better off just at room temperature, it just, it, it, it breaks down from, from one chemical into another. And this is what uh, Dr. Simon Williams and Dr. Peter Brooks were doing on the Sunshine Coast mm -hmm. in the Sunshine University, isn't it? They were actually um, calculating this process. So what you're speaking about now, yes. they've actually documented it and got the data on it. Yes, so they know what your they know what the uh, tran transfer ratio is from the DHA loss to the MGO gain. So they've worked out how many points of DHA needs, is lost before you get one point of MGO. So it's not one-to-one -one ratio. Okay. Uh, things like that are very technical and it's taken them a long time and it's still not exact. I've noticed with my own tests right. and with my own honeys, getting them retested, that what they say is sometimes not perfect, but um, it's pretty right. Uh, and the the DHA, um, now they have a database on all the different varieties and how strong they are and which ones are worth going to milk with your beehives and which ones aren't. So, so in Australia, so there's the plantations, but you can also just go to the, the, the parks as well, can't you, with your beehives? Yes, if you can find um, big reserves of the, the plant out in the bush, uh, you can put. You have to apply for leases for those places, and then put your beehives out there as they're coming into flower. Right. Yeah. Because also, this is very monoculture-ish as well for the bees, isn't it? You do have to feed them a, a broader range of food. Of pollens, yes. Mm. So, out in the bush, there's usually always something else around, right. and that will influence the flavour. It's only in plantations where they're getting um, just that plant. And for many acres, no matter which direction they go, um, there is pollen and uh, that are on the leptospermum. So for the short amount of time, that's usually okay. Um, but they can travel up to 10 kilometers and we don't have plantations that are that big. Yeah. So they do get what they need. Um, the best- So they do fly out of the plantation? Yes, then? they will. Okay. Yeah, and if, if there's eucalyptus that are opening up at the edge of that plantation, yeah. They'll fly straight across the plantations of the eucalypts because there are nectars that they prefer to eat. Okay. So they will they will choose one over another. Yeah, but then you just test your honey anyway. But there will still be a little bit of, of medicinal MGO being created in there, wouldn't there? Always, yes. Always. Even with my with my local honey, I have uh, different sites all around Tambourine Mountain and right up to Mudrabar, and I've even had the Mudrabar stock um, tested and it's come back at like 10 MGO. Okay. So that would mean that there is maybe about, maybe a handful of, of natural manukas around that area that yeah. they are feeding from. So it is getting in there. Yeah. It's just the concentration varies. Right. So you force it on them really by putting them in an area where that's um, mostly what's around them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're clever little things, aren't they? Yes, very <laughs> clever. So can you, you've just got a few of the, the samples, would you be able to just show us um, the difference and which one is which? Sure. Well, this one here is, was created by, uh, by Russell um, uh, from Limpenwood Nurseries. He's got uh, Manuka plantations down there and um, he has got a hybrid of a polygalifolium with a Petersoni. Um, which are leptospermums, and this is around about six to eight thousand parts per million DHA, which is about double New Zealand's Manuka and, and Australia's Scaparium. Um, so that's a high grade one. Sometimes it flowers at the wrong time though. So we've had this flower at winter time, and that's yes. not when we want it to flower. Yeah. This year it's flowering in spring, so we're pretty lucky. Um, however, that's a very hardy uh, plant. The polygalifolium has a lot of flowers. And the Petersoni is a very sturdy, strong plant. So to hybridize those two is to give a, a sturdy, strong plant a lot more flowers. So the polygalifolium is almost covered in flowers everywhere. Mm. Um, so that gives it the best of both worlds. Plus the nectar, it's, it's very juicy and that's what you're looking for as well. A lot of nectar production. Yeah. So that is a, a hybrid. This is a, 
um, what they call a jelly bush. So that's a, a normal um, leptospermum and polygalifolium, and these are usually around about 10 to 12,000 parts per million DHA. So about three times New Zealand's manuka. So it's quite easy to get a hospital grade, excuse me, a hospital grade uh, MGO, which is eight to 900 um, MGO. Normally you get that from this in big concentrated patches. It's not hard to get that from this. Yeah, okay. So, and then the scaparium, which is the one New Zealand are jumping up and down about, which is also native to Australia. That's this one here. They're much shorter leaves. They're more rounded um, shape and they're very sharp, spiky. very <laughs> spiky. Yes. So um, that's one thing you notice about them um, is they are not a most, the most pleasant uh, feeling plant. Um, and they aren't very suited to Queensland climate. So we have an in, inland scaparium and that's more bushy. This is more of a coastal scaparium and they go very spindly and long and they don't get very bushy unless you uh, hedge them. Right. So they have to be trained and they have to be hedged. Otherwise you will get long spindly growth with, with it yeah. and um, they break quite easily then. Well, because I practiced, um, I, I sort of experimented and planted a few of them and yes, that's the scoparium was, yeah, very tall, leggy kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Whereas in New Zealand, you'll notice that it gets very thick and dense and bushy. Yeah. That's because it's more suited to a cold climate. Uh, it's not really suited for up here. It goes really well in Tasmania, Victoria and South Australia mm. and New Zealand because of the cold climate. Um, but up here, it's not very suited. Yeah. Top of town, Mount Tambourine, they might get away with it yeah. because of the, the climate. It is a bit cooler up there, yeah. but same thing. It would have to be trained. It'd have to be uh, cut back. Okay. Yeah. And so what does it produce? Let's have a look at what, tell us about that. Well, this, <laughs> this is our uh, limited edition. Um, we're Manuka farmers, but I also work with other Manuka farmers as well, who uh, a couple have been kind enough. One in particular has been kind enough to help me. Um, has seen my passion for this and has helped me give, uh, give me a leg up into the industry and, and he also likes the way that I promote the, the honey yeah. and, um, and teach people and, and educate Australians about Australian Manuka honey. Yeah. So, uh, and because we are getting a lot of our customers have um, stomach infections and stomach problems, immune system problems, and it seems to be helping them quite a bit. Wow. So, um, I get lots of phone calls from people after they've been to the doctor crying and they're so happy that they've had years of problems and now they're all gone. So, so that's what's amazing, isn't it? Within the medical system, I mean, when you were at a hospital, nobody said try honey, did they? No. It just blows me away. Mm. So most of your customers then say, oh, I heard it through the grapevine or, do, or they just trip over your shop up at Mount Tambourine. Uh, sometimes they hear the information that I've given them. The information I've given them is directly from research that has been done, proven research. Um, a lot of it uh, is um, for external use, they will, the hospitals will use this if usually around about 800 to 900 MGO, they will use it on wounds and infections. Um, I think after they've already tried the pharmaceuticals and then that hasn't worked, then yeah. they will go for a, maybe a Manuka honey. Yeah. And that's usually if a nurse suggests it. Yeah. Um, a lot of the time it's the nurses who have to speak up and say, try Manuka honey on it. Yeah. And I get a lot of nurses into the shop saying, I, I told them to use this and it works. Yeah. So firsthand. But even just mention it. I mean, maybe they are mentioning it behind closed doors. I'd like to think so. <laughs> they, they are starting to. Okay. So I do get, I've had, I've had at least um, one surgeon, <clears throat> excuse me, one surgeon who was sent their uh, patients up who was going through chemotherapy uh, because of the ulcers that they get from the uh, immune systems being compromised yeah. and the bad stomach conditions that they get. I would say that's because of the um, good good bacteria uh, going in their stomach mm. uh, from the radiation. So they need to boost their immune system up, to boost their gut health up, yeah. but they're also getting a lot of ulcers. Uh, this has been shown um, that it can help suppress those uh, ulcers from occurring wow. because it is so antiseptic that those bugs don't get a chance to multiply and, and take that effect yeah. if it's used regularly. 
uh, as well as for uh, infections like H. pylori infections in the stomach, uh, IBS, which is, um, could be a range of, of problems, um, the bacteria and parasites. Uh, people with immune system de diseases like uh, Crohn's disease um, uh, and uh, any, any sort of gut issues, they tend to benefit from, from this. But it, for the infections, it's got to be at least 800 to 900 MGO and above. Right. So it has to be that concentration to have that effect on the multiple resistant bacterial infections. Yeah. Uh, but for normal cold and flu antiviral effect, it's got to be at least 300 MGO and up. Yeah, so that's when medicinal grade starts. And so what's this very special one? This is uh, 1,720 MGO. So this is a very limited supply. They're normally worth a couple of thousand dollars. Um, that's f if you were to buy it from New Zealand. Uh, there is a reason for that. They have to fly helicopters into the, yeah. to where their beehives are. So just traveling to milk the honey is costing them an absolute fortune. Yeah. That's the big dense patches. Um, here, luckily, we uh, can drive four-wheel drives in to get this, <laughs> but it's also rare for here. So um, there's not too many people that can have, that can produce that quality. Um, with so what species, or can you not say? <laughs> this is from uh, Polygalifolium. Is it really? Yes. Yeah, so this is wow. from what they would call jelly bush. Yeah. Um, and uh, the there is we we should be able to get this grade uh, once our plantation is complete. I have some plants that need to go in the ground, so we've decided to do that. And the ones that we have, there are hybrids of a polygalifolium, which is a jelly bush, yeah. crossed with a whitey eye. Yeah. So a leptospermum and whitey eye, they are one of the highest uh, testing DHAs. And the jelly bush is just covered in flowers. Yeah. So you get a lot more flowers with a lot more nectar coming out. And the nectar that's coming out is very high grade DHA inside. The only other person I know in Australia that's doing that is Ted Allender down in West Victoria. At uh, ERA Nurseries? Yeah. Yes. So uh, he has the same plants. Yes. Yes. So they're the ones that we got coming up as well. Okay. And, uh, but we have other varieties to put in so that when those ones are finishing, there's other varieties that are just starting to flower. So we're hoping to get a perpetual uh, uh, manuka harvest all year round. And with these ones that flower during winter, we will even have it coming in at winter time as well. Oh, that's so special. Yes. Because yeah, it was always, oh, well, from October through to February really, wasn't it? But I've got them flowering in all year round. Yes. Depending on what species they are. So we have ones called, um, uh, Liversigiis, which are uh, Bunning sells them as mozzie blockers, they call yeah, them. Yeah. And they're basically a uh, Leptospermum liversigii. There are about uh, around 7,000 parts per million DHA in the nectar. And they like a wet, boggy uh, ground to grow in. And they flower from uh, early February through to March uh, for a couple of months, just after some varieties of jelly bush. And um, the Peterson and I is also are at Christmas time. Uh, a lot of jelly bush are at the beginning of spring. So depending on how we plant, we may get a, a, a full year of every year of manuka harvest. The, the grading will change depending on where the, the, the beehives are yeah. and which plants they're feeding off, but it should always be active honey. So you'll keep your beehives there then, will you? Yes. Because And the surrounding area is pretty good with wattle and things like that? It is very dense. If you look around, you're in like a basin uh, of the mountain and it's just very dense, very thick. Yeah. So it's even if the manukas weren't there, it's a great place for the beehives. Yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, great. Hmm. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you. Um, we kind of battled the uh, whippersnipper a little bit. I'm pretty sure that mic will be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just have to come back and we'll do it all again. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> or you can do it from the shop if you wanted to and yeah. show people the uh, my man that stands out the front waving at everybody. Yeah. In his bee suit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't tell him what's in his pocket though. <laughs> right. That's for a surprise for the people oh. getting their photos taken. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go near his pocket. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you. I'll see how much of that I will keep in because it's probably two or three minutes yeah. worth of it. But um, 
Yeah, it's just something else that happens in the back of the ute because that's everyday life, isn't it? No worries. It's more, more organic, isn't it? What you were saying was absolutely perfect. Beauty.